Mary of Bethany. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus has raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly ointment of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with fragrance of the ointment. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to take what was put into it. 
Jesus said, Let her alone. Let her keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came, not only on account of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests planned to put Lazarus also to death, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. The Lord of the universe has given us everything. He has created us in his image. He has constructed a marvelous masterpiece of a world for us to gaze upon and see his fingerprint. He has sent us prophets and teachers even after we sinned against him. Finally, he has sent us his only son to die for our sins. The son, the perfect image of the father, imitates the father in everything, and he continues to give us everything. In the end, as the Father gave us his self in the form of the Son, the Word made flesh, the Son also gives his very self in the form of bread, taking from his creation an ordinary thing and making it into his own presence. What love! Imagine a husband that is not satisfied with showing his wife his love through mere words or with mere worldly gifts. No, his love is too intense, too deep to be captured in such small ways. He gives his wife everything he has. He gives his life. He dies for her. Thus the heavenly bridegroom has loved his bride, and even more greatly. He gives his bride his very self, his very body, so that he may live in her and she in him. Nothing else satisfies the intensity of the divine love. What have, what have we given back to our God, who has given us so much? Nothing satisfied the Lord until he gave us everything he had. How little do we give to him in return? How easily are we satisfied? How easy is it to say, enough? We give an hour a week at Mass and perhaps complain about the single hour if it becomes an hour and five minutes, or if it is five degrees too warm. Perhaps we refuse even this hour if it is raining or we are tired. We are saying with our actions, God is worth an hour a week, but not if, not if it is inconvenient. How lost we would be if God thought of us the same way. We give him an hour a week, then perhaps if we grow, we give him another few minutes of prayer every week or every day. Then that becomes enough. We may give of our money to the poor or to the church, and a few dollars becomes enough for God. A few minutes and a few cents are enough for the God who has given us every moment of our lives and every penny. Nothing is enough. Nothing was enough for God. Nothing was enough for Christ. Everything is what he gave us. Everything including himself. And we are bothered if someone suggests we go to Mass more than just on Sundays, or pray more than just a few minutes a day, or give more than a few dollars a week. Look at Mary of Bethany. She she may have had little or much, but she gave all she had. Costly perfume, 300 days wages worth, a pound of it, poured out without hesitation and without regret upon the feet of Jesus. The very best of what she had, given to the Lord for his use. There are two questions which arise. First, do we have anything so precious to give to our Lord? Are our souls so valuable? Do they have such a beautiful scent, or do they stink with sin? Then perhaps we should let the Lord take away the stench and make us clean by his grace, so that we can give our souls back to him with a perfumed scent. Secondly, after he has taken our souls and made them lovely in his grace, how much do we give them back to him? Do we pour out every ounce, or do we hold back? Mary of Bethany did not hold back, when she gave to Christ. Christ did not hold back when he gave to us. Our Father, we have wandered and hidden from your face. In foolishness have 
have squandered your legacy of grace, but now in exile dwelling, we rise in fear and shame. As distant but compelling, we hear you call on Judas, now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and the officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he accepted and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. And when the hour came, Jesus sat at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after supper, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes at his goes as, as, it, as it, it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they, be, and they began to question one another, which of them it was that would do this. In the garden, while Jesus was still speaking, there came a crowd, and the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray me? The, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those who were about him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests and officers of the temple and the elders who had come out against him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this, is, but this is your hour, the hour of the power of darkness. Reflection. The Lord and Redeemer being sold for silver. How shameful for Judas. How unreasonable and ridiculous to betray the Lord for money. And after such intimacy with him, such deep love shown to him, 
of what little value is silver compared to such a friendship with the Lord. But we should note that they began to question one another which of them it was that would do this. The apostles re realized that any one of them could have been the one to betray Christ. To sell him for money, each one of them was weak and sinful. They doubted, even themselves. We too are as weak and sinful as the apostles were at that moment. Any one of us could betray Christ to his death. And in fact, we have, because he died for our sins. We have sold him to his death, and we continue to do the same every time we sin. Every one of our sins is a silver piece that is offered for us to betray our Lord, to give him over to death. Pleasure, money, honor, and fame are worthless things offered to us, which we take in exchange for our friendship with God whenever we commit a sin. Yes, it was shameful for Judas to sell his Lord, but it is no less shameful for us. We have also sold our Lord for sin. The following hymn is about Judas, but it is not meant to instill our rage against him. It is meant to help us realize what we have done in participating in the Lord's death. As we read the events of Christ's life in this context, in the context of what we have done to him, let us allow our hearts to be softened by the grace of Christ. Each verse of the hymn could be read with our name in the place of Judas.
Peter. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. And after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though they all fall away, I will not. And Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, If I must die with you, I will not deny you. And they all said the same. And they went to a place which was called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not as I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And as Jesus was being struck by the guards, while Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the maids of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither, know, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the maid saw him, and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. And after a little while, again the bystanders said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you, are, you, are, you speak. And immediately the cock crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. As we share the blame with Judas for betraying the Lord with our sins, so do we share the bitter weeping of Peter for denying him. We are called to preach his name to all the world and to proclaim on rooftops what we have heard in secret. Do we follow his command or are we ashamed of the gospel? Are we willing to face shame or embarrassment for being associated with Christ or do we deny him before others, even with our silence? Even worse, do we act as he taught us to act, or even by our actions, do we deny that we are followers of Christ? Do we tell the world that we do not know him? By our lifestyle, we deny him in this way, even after all he did for us on this day, as Peter denied him, even as it was happening. How powerful an experience it must have been to have Jesus bring you with him as he went into the garden to pray and weep. What an honor. And yet Peter and the other two repeatedly fell asleep. What about us now? Is it not an equal honor to be with him, with the same Christ present? And how awake are we? 
But where Judas betrayed Christ and remained unrepentant, Peter repented with bitter weeping. Though he had fallen asleep earlier, he woke up when he, re when he heard the cock crow. It is time to wake up and realize what we have done in denying Christ in our words and actions. It is time to wake up and weep for our sins. Bari 
من برون حطيلي والآبات حون حنا Pontius Pilate. Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was early. They themselves did not enter the Praetorium, so that they may not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not an evil evildoer, we would not have handed him over. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. This was to fulfill the word which Jesus had spoken to show by what death he was to die. Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say this to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight that I might not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingship is not from the world. Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king, for this I was born, and for this I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no crime in him, but you have a custom, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. Will you have me re release for you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple, purple robe. They, they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you so that you may know that I find no crime in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of, of, of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no crime in him. The Jews answered, We have a law, and by that law he ought to die. Because he, had made, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard these words, he was the more afraid. He entered the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and, and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power unless... You would have no power over me unless it had been given, given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. Upon this, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement and in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of the preparation of the Passover, and it was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then they handed him over to them to be crucified.
Pontius Pilate, a government official, was a successful man in the eyes of the world. His personality is revealed most, however, in his question to Jesus, what is truth? To climb in worldly success is not in itself a bad thing. To have money and power and use them for God's glory is not only good, but expected of every Christian who has them. But when the climb involves dishonesty of any kind, then the soul begins to degenerate, to rot. The noble goals it had at the beginning are forgotten, and the only end becomes a continuous acclamation of wealth and power. The truth is sacrifice and lost. How far has Pilate gone? If he has to ask the question, what is truth? How deeply has he fallen? It probably began with a single lie or a single misleading comment. Then day after day, year after year, the lies mounted and dishonesty became a mightier and mightier habit. How far have we fallen? How deep is our dishonesty? If it is at the beginning, our hope is great indeed. God's grace is abundant. We can end it now before it consumes us. But what if we are closer to Pilate that we would admit? What if our dishonesty is so consuming that it, had been, that it has destroyed us entirely? What if we do not even know what the truth is anymore? Then we have by this dishonesty contributed to the death of our Lord despite every warning and every opportunity to turn back. It is not too late. Unless you return and become like children, you will not see the kingdom of God. Our Lord gives us the grace, the power to return to our original innocence, our original honesty, and to know that he is the truth. Simon of Cyrene. And as they led him away, they seized one, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore, 
and the breasts that never gave suck. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do this when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Simon was a bystander. He was minding his own business when he was pressed into service to carry someone else's cross. But what an honor it was to carry the cross of the Savior of the world, to have such a meaningful role in the salvation of the human race. It is quite possible that Simon was bothered when he was first told to help Jesus. But with an open heart and the grace that was being poured out upon the world at that moment, we can expect that he would have some realization by the end of what he just did and whom he had just helped. But what about us who believe in Christ as our God and Creator? Would we be so open-minded? Would we let our bitterness subside and allow ourselves to realize that we just helped our Lord? Simon carried the cross of Christ, a cross suited to our Lord, handcrafted with him in mind, not Simon. Yet he carried it. We are asked to carry our own cross, not that of Christ. Our, our cross, no matter what it is, must be so much lighter than the one that Simon carried, and yet we grumble against God because of it. God gives us crosses to carry, difficulties in life and work and family and our own souls for our own salvation. God prepares us a cross that is perfectly suited to our soul, a weight precisely balanced to make us stronger when we carry it, but not so heavy as to break our backs. God measures it perfectly, and we believe in Him and say that we trust Him. And yet we grumble and complain, telling God that it is too heavy for us, too irritating, too painful, too annoying, as if we knew better than He. If only we were worthy to help Christ carry His cross, rather the contrary is true. We cannot lift even our own without his help. Dismas, the good thief. Two others also, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with Jesus. And when they came to the place which is called the skull, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. And Jesus said, 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by, watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him vinegar, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him that read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The root of all sin is pride. The attitude that we are somehow greater than what God made us to be, and even greater than God himself. Any sin from the smallest to the greatest is an offense against the law of God, and it implies that we think we know better than he does. But despite our pride, God does not abandon us to the punishment we justly deserve. He offers us constantly the salvation of his son. He offers this to us at every moment. No matter what we have done in our past, no matter how heavy or wicked or disgusting our sins. Despair is a, is a sin of giving up on the possibility of salvation. When we despair, for example, after thinking about all the sins we have committed in our life and their gravity, or after trying, to, trying so hard to break a habit and falling again into it, we give in to the temptation to abandon the hope of salvation because our sins are so great. This too is pride. There is no sin in the world and no amount of sin that is too great for God to forgive in his mercy. Despair is saying, my sins are so great that they, have, they are greater even than God. It seems ridiculous to say it, and it is ridiculous to believe. Not only is God so great that he can forgive any sin in a moment, he is so loving that he chases after us, sending grace after grace, if only to let us turn back to him so that he can forgive us, embrace us with his loving arms, and carry us back to our home in his heart. The criminal who was crucified next to Christ probably lived a life of wickedness and had only a few moments left before his death and judgment. But in these few moments, he turned to his Lord and was saved by the powerful command of Christ. Whatever our sins, Christ is waiting nearby to forgive us and to offer us his salvation. In fact, Christ was so concerned with forgiveness being offered to mankind that he gave the power to forgive sins to, the, to his apostles, and he works through them until today. In the priests of the church, he continues to wait today for each one of us in the heart of the priest who sits in the confessional. Parce Domine, parce popolo tuo, ne in eternum iras caris nobis. Parce Domine,
Joseph of Arimathea. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn into two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw that, saw that he saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man is innocent. And all the multitudes who assembled to see the sight, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts, and all his acquaintances, and the woman who had followed, followed him from Galilee stood at a distance and saw these things. Now, now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man, who had not consented to their purpose and deed, and he was looking for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down and wrapped it in a linen shroud and laid him in a rock hue tomb where no one had, had ever yet been laid. It was the day of preparation and the Sabbath was beginning. The woman who had come from, from Galilee followed and saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and repaired spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. The blood of Christ having been spilled upon the ground of the hill called Golgotha, the ground having shook, the sun having hidden itself in sorrow. All that is left is a corpse nailed to a piece of wood and a dreadful silence, the moment that changed the world. Imagine being there in that stillness, watching the crowd slowly disperse after the death of the Messiah. The stillness of a hospital room after the death of a loved one is enough to silence anyone. But here, the stillness is different. The body is not sterilized, and stretched out on a white bed. It's mutilated and sickening to behold, hanging barely by what strands are left of its construction by splinters and rusted metal nails. But to the wise, to those who have the grace to know, this dead body is united perfectly, even now, to divinity itself. We do not know if this Joseph, a Jewish leader, had any clear idea that Christ was the Messiah he was waiting for. Most likely, after watching him die, he had given up that hope, as did many others, including some of the apostles. But even in this darkness and this doubt, he remembered the word of the Lord, Thou shalt keep the holy the Sabbath. No work, no burial on Saturday. The body must come down now. Using his connections, he arranged for the body to be taken down. Poetic flair and historical hindsight make it a remarkable scene. Movie makers and sculptors draw out the tenderness of Mary's touch and tears, the gentleness of John the Beloved, the awe of Joseph of Arimathea, in approaching the body of their Lord. But if there was ever a time when it was true to say, blessed are they who believe but do not see, this was it. The natural eye was blinded by black tragedy. Only the eye of faith could see beauty here, or providence, or meaning. Joseph dutifully wrapped the body in a linen cloth and placed it in a tomb. He was a good and righteous man, and he did this good deed out of his goodness and out of respect for the law of Moses. But we have the eyes of faith and can see more deeply what is happening. The corpse of the Son of God being taken down after accomplishing the salvation of the world was not an ordinary piece of matter, like any other grouping of molecules anywhere else in the world and at any other time. This is the divine body, drained of its blood and separated from it, one reverently being taken down from the cross, the other spilled at its foot. How awesome is this place, how powerful, how real. 
There's a similar silence in the church at night, after all have left. The lights are turned off as the sun was darkened, and the body of the Lord is reserved in the tabernacle. No natural or skeptical eye could have seen the significance of Christ's body being taken down and wrapped in linen. No eye without faith could have known what was happening and what it was that was being placed in the tomb. But the eye of faith can see the truth, the reality. The body of Christ that was taken down from that cross is now before us in the tabernacle of the church, except now united both to the blood and to the soul of Christ, perfect and complete, mystically present under the appearance of bread. How awesome must it have been to take Christ's body and wrap it in linen for burial. How reverent must Joseph have been, how trembling his hands. And how should we be when we approach the Eucharist at communion? The Blessed Virgin Mary. <clears throat> so they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote a title and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was, was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. The chief priest of the Jews then said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts, one for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was without seam, woven from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, They parted my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did this. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing near, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. 
A bowl of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of the vinegar on hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of, pre of preparation in order to prevent the bodies from remaining on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth, that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled, not a bone of him shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. It is impossible to comprehend the tender love between a son and his mother, and all the more so in the case of Christ and his mother. From each side, the love was complete and unmingled with any exterior thing. Christ has no human father, only his mother. Mary has neither a husband nor any children, only Christ. He is everything to her, and her every breath is a breath for him. Mary of Bethany gave the best she could, a jar of costly perfume for his feet, and Christ accepted it. But Mary, his mother, gave him much more. She gave him his earthly life, his body and blood. And as Christ could not stop giving until he gave all, so Mary gave her whole life to her son, knowing who he was. Yes, she had given him, him his human life, but she gave only what she had received from his divinity. Yes, she had given him his body and blood a little over three decades before, but she had been in his divine mind when he created the universe. And now on the cross, he returns what she gave him. He offers his body and blood to his father for his mother, the perfect symbol of the church triumphant. Every soul, was on a crisis mind as he hung on the cross and accomplished the salvation of the world. But he directed his attention in the last moment to a particular one. His hands, which had created the world, were fastened by nails to the cross and were unable to move. He who is the word through which all was created and through which everything continues in being, was unable to lift a finger to help his mother, and yet she was his highest concern. Woman, behold your son, the second Eve, the new mother of the human race, our mother, for we are that beloved disciple of Christ, and he entrusts us to his mother as to our own. He indeed gave us everything he had. Behold your mother, the disciple who had been so dear to the Lord's heart must still have shuddered in awe. The Lord trust, trusted him enough to let him take care of his dearest creature.
Jesus. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama shabakthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with vinegar, and put it on a reed, and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. But the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place. They were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. At the beginning of the faith, the father of faith, Abraham, brought his son Isaac to sacrifice him for the Lord. On the way, Isaac, noticing wood and fire, asked his father, but where is the lamb? Abraham answered, God will provide the sacrifice. Isaac's question was answered not by his father, but by the greatest of the prophets preparing for Christ, John the Baptist. It is he who said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God has indeed provided the Lamb for the sacrifice. He has become the Lamb himself. And here we see him sacrificed, freely, without force. He is the lamb of sacrifice and also the priest who offers his own blood upon the altar that is the cross. Finally, our faith tells us that he is also the God who accepts the sacrifice. Lamb, priest, and God, Christ on every side, at every angle of the scene. Every voice we have heard tonight speaks of him. Every eye gazes at his body, hanging on the cross. Every moment in history leads up to this one moment that changed the world, and every moment since then has been a consequence of it. It was not enough for God to send a prophet to teach. He had to come and teach us himself. It was not enough for God to send a king to rule on his behalf. He had to bring us his own kingdom into our hearts. It was not enough for God to love us from heaven. He had to come to earth and suffer everything we suffer to become like us in all things but sin. There is now no corner so dark that it is without God. Every inch of the universe is permeated with his presence, and every piece of our psyche is filled with his being because he has felt it all himself down to the darkest emotion of all. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? No earthquake is powerful enough to express what Christ expressed by these words. The Son of God became man truly, really. This is not a movie. This is not television. This is not a dream. This is real. God became one of us. He walked on this earth as we walk. He ate, he ate and drank as we eat and drink. He wept as we wept. He felt abandoned even as we sometimes do. What moment can compare with this one? What more can darkness do? What more does the devil want? God abandoned by God. There is nothing left for Satan to do to goodness or to the human race. Every attack, every bit of pain, every pinch of sadness was concentrated and poured out and absorbed by Christ. Upon him was laid the chastisement that makes us whole, and by his wounds we are healed. The veil between God and man was destroyed. 
ripped open from top to bottom because God ripped it open. God took away the separation between us caused by sin by taking the punishment for sin upon himself. Here, when it seems most vividly that the evil one has won, when darkness is all that is left, when God has abandoned even his most beloved, here is hope at its fullest. Here, God and man are united at last. After the earthquake, after the body was taken down, after Mary kissed her son goodbye and washed his corpse put into the tomb, there was darkness, but not a hopeless darkness. As we are meditating this evening on the suffering and great love of God for us and the suffering of Jesus uh, out of love for humanity, let us all entrust our souls and our lives into the hands of God, as Jesus said, into your hands, O Lord, I remit my soul. So let us all put our lives into the hands of the Lord and ask him to bless us, protect us, and save us from all evil hidden and manifests, now, at all times, and forever and ever. Amen.